Okay, welcome to today's presentation. We're going to go through um, technical review and talk about the tools we use and then talk about what we're looking for when we do technical review. Uh, the reason we're doing this presentation now is because we're rolling out the corporate database for harmonized reports, but also I wanted to make a presentation that would um, help with the consistency and what the reviewers should be looking for in different sections of the CF41. So the tool rollout was uh, timely in that respect. So what we're going to do is go through the goal of technical review, the processes that I talked about, and that'll be very quick. Um, what to look for, and then a word about transfers since we get an ANAB finding on this. So why do we do a technical review at all? Well, really, we do it because 17021, paragraph 952, requires it. This is really all you're going to find in 17021 about technical review. What's the goal? What's the purpose? This very first bullet, the information provided by the team is sufficient with respect to the certification requirements and scope of the certi certification. And then it has a couple bullets about the closing of the findings. So that's not very much when you read it. Think about all the things that we look for in technical review. Well, technical review is basically a QA function for a registrar. But from its inception, it was really intended for one purpose, and that's making sure that the team's recommendation aligns with the artifacts of the audit, which are the report, the detail notes, and the closed findings. Okay, so you need to remember this when you're going through technical review. You need to remember what your overall goal is to make sure the information is sufficient with respect to the certification requirements and the scope. We're not re-auditing the job. We're not looking to make FPY. If they didn't do it the way we would do it, we would do it. Well, maybe we'll give them some feedback, but it, we're not there to make sure they do it the way Dave does it or whoever's reviewing the report does it. We want to find a path to certification for our clients. Think about when you go on site to do an audit. Do you say you're there to make findings? No, you say you're there to find objective evidence in order to certify the company. We're there to find objective evidence in that pile of documentation that the auditor or lead auditor has given us that we could certify the company. That does not mean we certify anything, just like we went in on an audit. It has to be compliant. But you have to remember this, minimally compliant is still compliant. D for diploma was my old college statement. Or, uh, uh, and it still holds true in all things. It may not be the prettiest audit, but if it's a compliant audit, it still generates a certificate. Now, there are other things we look for, right? We have a lot of interested parties. One of our interested parties is the auditor. We want to get them feedback for improvement beyond our job of making sure the uh, information is there to issue the certificate. We give information to CERT groups so they can issue a certificate. It has to be clear. The client wants a certificate. The, cust the client's customer wants to make sure our certificates have integrity, so they're really interested in the statement. DQS and Ant Management wants to say we have good auditors that follow our quality policy. They want to issue certificates fast so that we can have customer satisfaction. So all these things are things you have to keep in mind when you're doing a technical review. But your main goal is this goal from 17021. Here's a little baby process flow, not really a process flow. It's new because we are now using the corporate database for the Harmonize programs. So the orange stuff is stuff that is pertinent to Harmonize programs. The blue stuff is pertinent to any program. Job is assigned to an audit center. EG assigns it shows up in your queues in TR. I'm going to show you this. For harmonized programs, you're going to open up the corporate database. I will show you how to do that. Documents are in the corporate database and a few will be in Audit Center. We'll talk about that. Now we're back in Audit Center. Document comments from and your FPY in the CF41 in Audit Center. There's going to be a CF41 in Audit Center. That's where you're going to document everything. There's going to be one in corporate database. That's where you're going to say okay to everything. I'll talk about that. You're going to send comments using the Audit Center attention required emails. We don't want you to send emails outside of Audit Center. I need you to use the system of record because that's how we tell whether reports are really being reviewed when we're checking the queues as management. Copy yourself on the email. There's been some issues with those attention required. You want to make sure that email really went. 
You as a reviewer need to check your your queues weekly. Sometimes auditors forget to hit a button. Sometimes attention required emails don't go as, as they were advertised. Checking your queues will make sure you don't have anything that's hung up in there. Nobody has that many reports. It would take you more than a few minutes to check them at least once a week. Once comments are resolved, you should get an email back telling you they're resolved. If you don't, you're checking your queues so you'll know they've been resolved. You go in and you verify the ARA. Once the ARs are closed, uh, you check the whether the job is going to the certificate on the VG tab. I will show you that. You sign the CF41. If there's no good, you go through another uh, FPY issue on the and another attention required email. Now we're over at Harmonized Programs. We've completed the review in Audit Center. In the corporate database, you go in, find the job, assign yourself to it, and you need to close out the TR in the corporate database. How do you do that? You put that BR number in there, toggle to the TR tab, click everything OK. We're not repeating the FPY that we gave here. We're just going to say OK in the corporate database. Record the cert decision and sign off. It's super easy. I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm going to start with the corporate database, uh, mostly because that's the new thing that we're going through right now. How do you get to it? Go to the DQS internet. There's important links. Hit this link. A logon screen will pop up. Username, logon. Same as you log on for any DQS application. You don't need the DQS QS. How do you find your report? You go over on the left side of the screen. Unclick all these filters. You can click released only if you want. Put your BR number in. Hit return. A bunch of stuff will pop up here. You're looking for the one that has a green X in, the, in here that says the um, CC's completeness check has been done. You might see multiple things in here. You want to find the right one. So you can scroll around in here. There's a scroll bar down here. But you want the one that completeness check is done for the date of the audit you're looking for. So you found your job. Now you need to assign it to yourself. There's a drop down here. Now in Audit Center, the job was assigned to you. I'll talk about that in a second. Here, you got to assign it to yourself. You find yourself. You click Assign TR. Now you're the TR. Now remember, in the corporate database, you have already done the TR in Audit Center. We're just closing out the job. You toggle to the left on the right-hand side of the screen. You'll see this sort of view. You hit this, Toggle Review Pane. Your pane will pop up. It pops up as completeness check. You have to remember to hit this button that takes you to the technical review uh, pane. When you hit that button, you'll see this. And everything is okay. Don't worry if you had FPY in Audit Center. If you hit it FPY here, you're going to double dip the system. Everything is okay here. You hit this drop down for the cert decision. This is the only place you want it to match exactly with Audit Center. You hit approve report, you're done. You closed it out in the corporate database. All right. Now we're going to go back over to Audit Center. How do you get there? Same important links. Hit this. Hit this again. You're in Audit Center. What do you do once you're in Audit Center? Sorry, I had my thing on there. Uh, you're going to see a couple tabs. You're going to find your report, right? They've been assigned to you. So here's your queues. You go into technical review. These are the queues I'm talking about. These are ones that are assigned to you that nothing's been done. These are ones that are assigned to you that you've reviewed them, but the ARs are not closed. These are ones that are in final. These are ones with at active attention required, which means you made a comment. So you select your role. You see your queue down here. See, I got some red ones. They have attention required, and I got one I haven't reviewed yet. That's my cue from a few weeks ago. These are the cues you need to walk once a week. You just click on each one and see that things are moving along. When you've clicked on a job, at the bottom of the job, you'll see this view. You'll see two tabs that are very important to you. The VG tab. This is where you're going to check whether this is going to have a cert or not. It's very important. EG will pick whether it's going to cert or not. However, sometimes they might miss it. During the course of review, you might come to understand that the auditor is trying to make a change. Maybe EG missed that, or maybe it's a multi-site. So there are a couple situa 
situations where you you want to uh, double check for VG. Everybody makes mistakes and everyone's human, and we want to um, check each other's backs. TR the TR tab. That's where you're going to find your CF41. So here you tabbed over to VG. This is what I'm talking about. If this says yes, that means when you sign the CF41, this is going to go to the cert group. So you just want to spend one second to toggle over here and make sure it's marked correctly. It's hard to tell sometimes, especially if you're doing a multi-site, which one is going to go to cert or not. In Audit Center, there's something called the SOV notes. They show up at the very top of the Audit Center entry. They try and give you a clue as to whether it's going to uh, cert or not. If you're unsure, email VG. Ask them. Don't guess. The worst thing you can do is issue a cert before everything has been reviewed. Or not issue a cert when we should have been issuing a cert. Now you're going to toggle back to the technical review. This is your tab. This blue button is the CF41. You're going to hit it. Uh, this is where you're going to document your review. All these questions are in here. You need to answer all these questions. Is okay or not okay? If you say something's not okay, write a little bit of, of what the issue is here. So you're going to give the auditor some feedback on the attention required, which I'll show you next. But the record of review is the CF41, not those attention required emails. They're not archived. CF41 is archived. There are two types of issues. A level one, you can see it marked here. That means it stops it from going to cert. Level two does not necessarily stop it from going to cert. You can still issue a cert with an open level two comment. I will generally hold for level twos unless it's an urgent cert, and then I'll send it forward. But I'll still look for the resolution to the level two comment. Sometimes when you hit that not okay, or always when you hit that not okay, it generates an FPY, but sometimes the FPY is done incorrectly. Maybe you hit it by accident, maybe you hit it and then the auditor responded and you go, oh, that wasn't a valid one. If you want to get rid of an FPY, you come over here to the right hand side of the screen and you hit this little trash can and the FPY is gone. You want to make sure you do that because auditors are scored on their first pass field. These are the attention required. We want you to use the system. Don't want you to send emails outside of the system. If you want to do that, then do this and that. I organize mine in a certain way. Um, I write it this way. Question. Something's unclear. I haven't given them FPY. I'm asking something. Comment. Something is wrong. It needs to be corrected. If I know how it should be corrected, I will tell them this is what you need to do. So we're not... Asking them to guess our favorite color, we need to be very clear in our verbiage and if we know what they need to do to fix it, tell them. It'll make it all go faster. Feedback. You don't have to fix it. It's something you could be done better um, for next time. Label them clearly. Give them all the direction you can. And my last word here is don't be a jerk. Nobody likes getting these attention required emails. I got one the other day. I looked at it and it was for AS, and I'm new at AS, so I know I'm making mistakes. And it made me want to cry. It had so many mistakes in it. And it's not because I was trying to do a bad job. It's because there's things I didn't know or didn't understand. So I'm learning, and a lot of our auditors are also learning. Um, these are your peers. These are the people that make the money for us. You need to treat them with respect. So just remember, you probably don't like getting these emails either. They don't like it either. Just don't be a jerk about these. Okay, you should re expect a response in a couple of days. If it goes more than a week, you can hit the send reminder. I always copy the BLM when it, if it's gone more than a week. Uh, I expect nobody is that busy where they can't answer a couple comments in a week's time. Now, sometimes it happens people on vacation and then I'll like, okay, I'm not going to copy the BLM if I know the guy's on vacation. Um, but if they're just not responding, then you need to get management involved. It is not the job of TR to run down comments. Now we're getting to the end. Sometimes we have uh, multi-site certificates. You cannot issue a certificate unless all the sites have been audited and reviewed. So it's, uh, unless it's sampled, of course. 
the last site to go through the review process and the one that said, should say cert yes back on that VG tab. We try and assign the same reviewer for the multi-sites. There are SOV notes like I talked about on the top of uh, Audit Center that make comments about what the last one is going to be. You as a reviewer have to answer this question. If you're, if you're doing the one that is going to certificate, this question better be answered yes. You have to check it. How do you check it? Well, you can look them all up in Audit Center. You can know because they were mostly assigned to you. You can ask the CSP which ones were supposed to be audited and check whether they've been reviewed. But you have to do something to make sure you can honestly answer this question. If you do this wrong, it means you're going to issue a cert when we either haven't audited all the sites or haven't reviewed them all. That's a major nonconformance. So to pay care to this, we've done this wrong. This question is in here because we've done this wrong a, a few times. This box reviewer notes. This is where you're going to give specific direction to CG. You have to be very literal. CG is a literal group of people on purpose because certs are done a certain way. This is where you record your decision. You hit this button, and you're done. You've done your review, and then you would go over to the corporate database, the thing I started with, and document it there. Now, what are you going to look for when you when you hit that blue button and um, you see all those questions? First one is T10. T10 has a lot of questions in it. The main things we look for, I'm not saying you don't have to answer all of them. I'm saying these are the main things we look for. Does the employee count match the count on the ADC in the report? Because that has to do with the days, right? The days are calculated out of MD5 for most of the programs um, and sector-specific schemes for others. The main thing you're looking for under T10 is did they do the right amount of days? Match the days that the ADC tells you to the agenda, which is how many days they did, to the report. Did they do eight hour days? So seven and a half hours is not eight. I'm going to show you an example. You want to watch for carryover time. You can't do 10 hours one day and then do uh, six hours the next. You can in certain situations for certain programs. I'm going to show you an example. You don't want to see excess reporting time. Somebody wrote me the other day and said, hey, this, this one has more than 10%. It had 12%. We're not slavish to this. It's got to be close to 10%. If they're using off-site off reporting time to make their eight hours, they can do that if it's on the agenda and they have the approval of the BLM. Some programs require a third of the time to be spent in production. Uh, most do not, but we are looking for them to do about a third of the time in production. Don't be slavish. It's hard to do a third of the time in production on a half-day audit or a one-day audit and cover all the required clauses, which are now in Q0900-5 and CP3 or CD3. That's where you would see where they're documented. If their agenda doesn't match the client's interaction of process diagram, don't ding them on that unless the agenda is totally clause-based. And T10 has a question about shifts. I want you to apply it if they have a shift problem, not under T10, but under T30. That's where we want to apply that. I said I would show you, and here's what I'm showing you. Here's a 10-hour day that's equal to one day. Here's a 10-hour day that's equal to 1.25 days for an ISO audit. Why? Because two of the hours here were done on the off shift, and we allow carryover. None of the hours here were done on the off shift. Area where it's not is only allowed for production on the off shift. Here's an agenda that is seven and a half hours, eight to six. It has more than 10% reporting time, two hours that were done in reporting. It has 12% of the time in production. I would flag this one. Why? Because for a one day audit, that's too much time in reporting. They should have given some of that time to here in production. T20, you're only going to use it if section 3 is complete, of the report is completely empty. T30 is the value-added section of our review. Here's where you're going to look for sampling and coverage. In section 3 of the report, you want to see summaries of the samples. You want to see it for training, calibration, dot control, production, inspection. You can read, so you should see it all there. It should look like this. 
Sample 10 car records. That's it. Simple statement like that. The detail notes or the auditor notes will give the exacting sample. Here we're just looking for a summary. If they haven't summarized the sample the first time I see it, I give them feedback. Why? Because this is an internal DQS thing that we want and it was communicated in a white paper May, May 2018 and during the uh, national meetings. But I have my evidence and if I have my evidence in the detail notes, I'm giving them feedback. The second time I see it, I give them an FPY. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, when you're reviewing enough, you see the same people over and over again. So you'll get used to what they give you in reports. When you're looking at sampling, you want to see normally six to eight. You might see smaller sample sizes and things like design or maybe contract review if they have massive contracts. Um, if they have smaller sample sizes for, say, design, they should say why. You know, here's a statement. Design, no new projects. That's acceptable. That explains why there's not a huge sample size. You want it to, to see sampling goes back in time. You don't want to see all sampling from the date of the audit. So looking at inspection records, they should go back in time. This is from that May 18 um, white paper. There's a bad one. Here's a bad Section 3 write-up. Solid audit results, CO5, so it doesn't tell you anything. Here's a minimally compliant one. 10 of 10 records were good. They gave you the sample size. Here's a really good one. They talk about the process, and here's the sample size over here. Again, this was communicated to them. That white paper's on the auditor portal. Um, no reason they shouldn't be doing it. Other things to look for, I said on T30, we want to do the shifts. So don't double hit them in 10 and 30. Hit them only in 30 shifts if they're not doing them. Some programs like AS and TS require shifts to be done. But we want shifts to be done for all programs. Now, they might have a reason, and Q0905 gives you some reasons. Um, but it better be a darn good reason. Sometimes people will say, oh, um, you know, it's just assembly on the second shift. Well, I don't care. We want them to do it. Where do problems happen in the companies? Where are all the new people? Are they on first shift? No. Management's on first shift. The more senior employees are on first shift. It's the second and third shift where you don't have management, you don't have the senior employees. You have the less uh, skilled employees in many cases, at least. You want to go there and look and see what they're doing. I had an uh, example from uh, two weeks ago where I did a process on first shift. Guy showed me how he inspected. He was using calipers. I went to the same process because it was still running on second shift for the same part. I asked the guy how he inspected it. He took this big hunk of metal and goes, if this fits in, in the hole, it's good. And you should have seen the look on the face of the management rep. That's the kind of things you find that help a company is clearly this guy was inspecting it incorrectly. If they didn't hit the right clauses, um, you hit them on, you give them a ding in uh, T30. Again, pay particular attention to design. It is required annually, both in Q0900-5 and the C3. Read section three. I skim through it. I'm looking for that sampling. If I see them saying something's done off-site, I look at what they're saying, and then I go and make sure that activity is listed on the certificate. If they're saying something is done as part of the QMS at an off-site location, that location should be listed on the certificate. T40 is where we do our changes. So changes to the scope, name, and address. There is a document called the L44. That's our contract with our clients, A for amendment. If they're trying to change the name and address, there needs to be an L44A. Do not ding them. You do not ding anybody if there's no L44A. You merely put the job on hold. It'll be an audit center. If you don't see one, you put the job on hold. You contact the CSP and tell them we need one. And everything's on hold until we get it. The thing you're going to mostly find in T40 is right here. You're going to see in Section 3, because we require a mark cert, that people are going to say, see mark cert for changes. That is not acceptable. We did a webinar communicating that. They have to write the changes out in Section 6.3. Marks is not a, a record. 
The record is the report, and the report needs to contain the changes. It's our accreditation requirements. If they have a poorly written scope, you're not going to ding them here. You're going to ding them under T70 normally. You can see there's some re repetition between these things, and we want to kind of bin our things appropriately. T50 is about hidden nonconformances. It's an OFI really uh, minor nonconformance, or it's an OFI consulting. I'll give you some examples. Document 1234, Rev 5, observed and used wrong revision, one of 10 samples. That was written as an OFI. Is it an OFI? No, it's a minor nonconformance. We found one, it was the wrong revision, so wrong revision is a use, that's a 7.5 issue. Unable to see evidence of how risk and opportunity is considered for corrective action. It's a little trickier. This one is kind of in your face. This one, you have to know that 10.2 has a requirement for risk and opportunity to be part of corrective action. So it's not an OFI to make. If they didn't see evidence, it's not an OFI. It's a finding. Client should implement the use of five lives to get better root cause. Is that a finding? Nope. Is it consulting? Yep, because you're telling them a method. If this guy had written uh, uh, the client system for root cause analysis could be more robust, no issue, that's an OFI. But when you tell them the method, now you've become a consultant. So that's what you're looking for under T50. T60, this is the action request. This is a new one. Back in RAM, we had three boxes for the three parts. In audit manager, we don't. So, you, so this has become a problem. You want to see... The statement of nonconformity, the ISO statement in the OE. We want to look at the root cause of the client's responses. Is it acceptable? Did we accept something? Did the auditor accept something that had bad root cause? I use a lighter hand here because, again, um, some findings, if it's procedural, what's the root cause really going to be? You know, you have to uh, use some uh, common sense. Is the NC miscategorized? And normally this is a major that's been called a minor of example on the next chart. Here's a new one. Back in RAM, for the previous ARs, we would have boxes. So you would say there were three previous ARs, and three boxes would pop up. In Audit Manager, we don't have that. So where are they supposed to document it? Mr. Brannick sent out a note saying document it in Section 3 of the report. So you have to pull the previous report. It's in the uh, previous audit documents in Audit Center. Um, Look at how many ARs they have and then check. I always check the list of evidences if they have the previous ARs addressed in either there or I check in the um, detail notes, then maybe I'll give them a feedback the first time. But you need to see closure of the ARs. It should be in 10.2's write up. And then did, the docu did they document the ARA appropriately? You want a description of what they looked at, not just generic cut and paste statements. And I'll show you one on the next chart. So here is a major nonconformance that was miscategorized. It's the shipping of nonconforming product. During the audit, observed out auto tolerance. This uh, whatever feature was measured at 12.8285. It was supposed to be between 11.9 and 12. You list a few of them. Um, and then he says, this is great. QA manager confirms that the customer agreed the deviation since a long time this was a foreign job. There's no customer confirmation evidence for the deviated tolerance. You hear this all the time, right? Oh, yeah, the customer has always been taking that. That doesn't work for you. It shouldn't have worked for this guy. You need to see objective evidence that the customer has agreed. It could be something in writing. It has to be something in writing, a record, not just somebody's word that it's okay. Bad ARA. Here's some ARA. Objective evidence provided to show correction of DP1. Action acceptable. Close. Follow up next to audit, say, surveillance. Lots of words, right? But did I tell you what I looked at? No, I did not tell you what I looked at. So even though there's a lot of words, it doesn't meet the requirement. If this person had said, uh, saw audit reports showing independence of auditors, uh, action acceptable, close, verify, and next surveillance, that would have been better. It probably would have been minimally compliant because they gave some evidence that of what they looked at. Not many more words, but a little bit of a, uh, what they were actually reviewing that made them feel that the action was acceptable. 
Okay, T70, very similar to T40. This is where we're going to hit them generally on poorly written scopes. So I'm going to start with the thing we got written up for on ANAM. Got to be careful with certain types of scopes. So each address on the cert much have a scope statement. Now there are some certs where the scope will be um, the manufacturer of blah, blah, blah for all sites herein. That means all sites have to do exactly the same thing. So if the scope is the manufacturer of washers and dryers for all sites herein, and you have a site that's making dryers and you have a site that's making washers, are all sites doing exactly the same thing? No, they are not. So this is a very rare scope. It's very rare that you have all sites doing exactly the same thing. To kind of read the report, if you, your ears should prick up if you see this verbiage in the scope. You want to make sure it's, it's uh, correct. There's not a lot in 17021 on scopes. It says, um, describe the extent and boundaries of the audits, such as sites, organizational activities, processes to be audited. So our customers sometimes want to use the scopes for marketing. Part of getting ISO is to get business. It's usually the main part of it. We don't want wild statements in there, but if they want to have some flexibility in their wording, you can grant it. Even though we have some guidance in this Q0907-30, 17021 doesn't have a lot on scopes. So again, you want to use a lighter hand on the actual wording of the scopes. Did the team audit everything at every place? This is back to that uh, discussion on multi-sites and sites in remote locations. If there is an exception to design, is it justified? You just can't say design is an NA. They need to justify it. If there is a current cert, does the report match what's on the cert? Unless they're trying to change it. So again, this is where you're looking at the scope and you're looking to make sure they covered all the boundaries and sites and that sort of stuff part of our 1701 review requirement. T80, it's the things you're going to look for. If they had a major, did they do a special? And is there a special report? You cannot close a major without a special. You cannot close a major without a special report. If the special was off-site, the BLM has to approve it. Then you're going to look at the next audit date. You don't want it too close to cert expiration. It can be too there's some rules in the queue procedures related to how far, how close it can be, and you want to make sure the next days are correct per the ADC. That's in section five and six of the report. Transfers. So that's the CF41, and I'm going to transition into transfers because we had a finding. This is the procedure that defines the transfer process. It has a two-step process, a review by a lead auditor, Review by TR cannot be the same person. Both people have to sign the CF41. You see it's underlined because that's what our finding was. Cannot be the same person. Both people must sign the CF41. There's a list of documents. They're part of this procedure. Sales gets them for you when we're doing a transfer. The lead has to confirm the scope, make sure we're accredited for it, make sure the cert is valid that we're transferring. Um, the lead has to contact the previous CB using this form and gives all the list of things we're contacting for. You have to make three attempts. No response. You elevate it to the director of accreditations. I usually give a few weeks. That's Dina, the director. I usually give a few weeks. If it's urgent, I'll do my three attempts in one week because it's urgent. Um, once the lead approves the CF-161, VG will assign it to TR. We'll review those results. So again, two steps. It gets assigned by VG to a lead. It gets assigned by VG to a TR. And with that, I'm going to show you a chart I showed you at the very beginning. Remember what we're doing. The main goal of review is to ensure that the information provided by the audit team is sufficient with respect to the certification requirements and scope of the cert. Minimally compliant is still compliant. You need to keep in mind the needs of all the interested parties. Our customers customers want to know our certs have integrity, that they matter, that we really audited the system. Our customers want certificates that are helpful for them in, in marketing. They want value-added audits. They want certificates fast. DQS management wants us to get 
talked things through, but they also want us to maintain the integrity so that we can continue to be a viable registrar. All these things you have to keep in mind when you're reviewing a report. But the main thing you need to keep in mind is this 17021 statement. I keep going back to it because it's so important. Was the information provided by the audit team sufficient with respect to the certification requirements and the scope of the cert? With that, I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, you can reach me via email. Thanks.